Okay, let's get started. Welcome everyone. Thank you very much for taking time out of your day for joining today's CNCF webinar, Secure Self-Service Kubernetes. I'm Jerry Fallon and I will be moderating today's webinar. Just a few housekeeping. We would like to welcome our presenter today, Mr. Jim Bhagwadia, founder and CEO of Nirmada. Just a few housekeeping items before we get started. During the webinar, you are not able to talk as an attendee. There is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So please feel free to drop your questions in there and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. This is an official webinar of the CNCF and as such is subject to the CNCF Code of Conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat or questions that are in violation of the Code of Conduct. Please be respectful of your fellow participants and presenters. Please also note that the recording and slides will be posted later today to the CNCF webinar page at cncf.io slash webinars. And with that, I will hand it over for, to our presenter for today's webinar. All right, thank you, Jerry, and thanks everyone for joining. So today we are gonna talk about secure self-service Kubernetes. Um, so just to kind of unpack that and set the context a little bit, um, if you think about where we are today in the cloud native journey as, you know, as the space evolves, there's several ways that we all know and that we all use to bring up Kubernetes clusters um, to and you know kind of use them for our personal use, right? So it's fairly easy to spin up Kubernetes, whether it's on our laptops, um, on different virtual machines, cloud instances, or even using a cloud provider. You know, it's possible to get uh, you know a Kubernetes cluster running fairly easily. But the challenge is that you know when we work with enterprise customers, larger organizations, the challenges that you typically end up facing are what we think of as day two challenges, right? So this is once you're past that initial deployment, it's dealing with Kubernetes configuration management, um, especially around the security and best practices of configuration, having visibility and governance into uh, the cluster configurations, uh, what's running on clusters, um, and making sure that the required services are running, and then dealing with cost compliance, uh, as well as you know managing, uh, of course, the amount of clusters and the amount of resources that get used, right? And it's interesting with every new technology. It seems like uh, when virtualization came out, we had VM sprawl. So now certainly we're starting to see the signs as Kubernetes continues to explode in. Uh, popularity, we're trying, starting to see Kubernetes sprawl uh, also happening, right? So what's the way to deal with this? Um, we all know that, you know, in, in our space, especially, and given where we are, going back to a traditional IT approach where, you know, you're creating IT tickets and you're waiting for resources to be provisioned or some central team to manage things, those days are gone, right? So uh, there's no way we want to go back to that style of doing things. But at the same time, you know, the completely going in the other direction doesn't work either, right? So uh, making all of this, uh, the, you know, Kubernetes management, cluster management, a developer responsibility uh, is just, you know, uh, not going to work also. Um, and as we continue to, as Kubernetes evolves, if you go to any offering, right? So I was looking uh, just a few days ago at, at the Google console, uh, the GKE console, right? And it's amazing how many different features, how many options, how many different, um, you know, items are now available there. So how do developers know what to provision, what's required for their enterprise, and how, how do you manage this at scale, right? So certainly this is not uh, the best practice either. And there has to be a proper balance. So we want to get, as developers, as a software developer myself, I, I don't want to, you know, if I need some resources, I want to be able to self-service, create them as needed, uh, get them at the right time and dispose of them if I'm not using them. Uh, but I want to make sure that I'm compliant with my enterprise policies. I want to make sure that these clusters are secure. And I want to make sure I'm, of course, managing costs and expenses correctly. Uh, without you know having to sort of um, take on the additional burden of managing things at scale, uh, but do this in an easy manner, right? So that's the topic we're going to cover today. And you know, just to kind of uh, actually get to the punchline, and uh, we'll go through these uh, in, in each detail. But what I'm going to show today is there's at least three things you're going to need 
to achieve what we are just saying. So to get to secure self-service Kubernetes, you require policy management and especially workload policy management. Um, you require some form of virtual clusters and I'll talk about uh, some of the work going on in various, you know, Kubernetes working groups, as well as, you know, commercial tools and things that are available for Kubernetes virtualization. And then you're going to need add on service management in a central and scalable manner. So these three are the fundamental things that we believe are required um, to do secure self service Kubernetes. And of course, as the space evolves, as more things come in, this, this list may grow, but at least as of today, these are the fundamentals that you will need. So just a quick introduction. Uh, I'm Jim Baguadia, founder and CEO at Nirmata. Um, within the Kubernetes community, I work in the policy working group as well as in the multi-tenancy. And some of the things that I will present today are directly related to uh, ongoing efforts, things that are happening within these working groups. Um, certainly, you know, if you are on the Kubernetes Slack, feel free to reach out. If you're interested in any of these topics, feel free to reach out and uh, join in in one of our sessions. All right, so before we get into these, the three things I mentioned, I want to kind of take a small detour and talk about cluster sizing, right? Because this uh, is an often, uh, you know, kind of a uh, debated point in terms of should you have large clusters, small clusters, or how do you manage clusters within a larger organization, right? So, uh, of course, and, you know, uh, it, it's possible to say, okay, well, let's just do uh, spinning up clusters is easy. So let's do one cluster per app. Uh, or, you know, maybe we have a, you know, hybrid kind of model where we're doing one cluster per team. If you happen to be, uh, you know, working with on-prem clusters or private, you know, sort of uh, data center type deployments, um, you are more likely to be on the other side of things, right? You'll have larger shared clusters because these are fixed cost resources, the assets which have already been deployed, and you're going to end up with, you know, trying to securely share these clusters across your teams, across your organization. So, you know, so some of these you can think of as single use clusters, right? Either one team or one application using those. And the idea is that you, you know, you kind of, you know, make it easy to provision or you just allow your teams to go to your cloud provider of choice. And with some governance, they're able to bring up their own clusters. And that, you know, it seems easier because there's less to do from a central point of view. But of course, it's going to lead to inefficient resource usage because each, you know, there's, um, of course, everybody's going to over, uh, sort of over provision based on their capacity requirements. And the net resources that you're going to end up using are going to be far greater. And you're going to have many more clusters to secure and manage, right? So perhaps, you know, if you're dealing with three to five clusters, this is not a problem. But once you get to double digit clusters, or, you know, in some cases, even dozens or hundreds of clusters, this becomes a daunting challenge in terms of how to manage and secure them uh, a, across all of these. On the other side of things, on the other side of the spectrum, if you're using extremely large clusters, I mean, yes, you can get better utilization. Um, you kind of now will require some team to manage these clusters. So perhaps that's a drawback or that's a benefit, depending on how you perceive that but there will have to be an operations team managing these clusters. Um, and, and then, you know, these uh, larger clusters can be more complex to manage as well. So because of the multi-tenancy, and we'll talk, you know, specifically about some of those details, what's required to achieve multi-tenancy uh, based on namespaces and other uh, Kubernetes constructs. So both, you know, both options have some trade-offs. And really what it comes down to is that, of course, you want to share clusters whenever possible, but you have to invest in the automation to be able to do this. And we'll look at some ways of achieving that. But even if you have shared clusters, you are likely to end up with multiple clusters for dev tests, for staging, for production. Um, perhaps you have several regions in which your applications are deployed. So multiple clusters is going to happen, right? The question is just how many uh, and who's managing them. And independently or regardless of, you know, how you uh, end up organizing your clusters and organizing, you know, access to clusters, 
every cluster needs to be secured and properly configured because uh, if you're running your applications on it, most likely they're accessing secrets. Even if it's a test cluster, if somebody is, gets access to that, uh, you, you know, bad things could happen, right? So every cluster needs proper security. And as you'll see, there are tools and there are things available uh, to help with these. All right, so let's dive into, you know, uh, the first topic that I mentioned, which is workload policies. So the, the goal of these policies are, you know, if you're familiar with Kubernetes, of course, there's the workload API and there's several, you know, constructs available as we're defining and manage applications, right? So uh, the, the, like with everything, you know, in Kubernetes, there's plenty of choices and there's plenty of ways to perhaps, you know, um, uh, I guess, uh, make mistakes or even insecurely configure uh, various things, right? And this is where workload policies become extremely important to uh, make sure to audit your configurations, to make sure that they're secure, uh, your workloads are well configured, and they're following best practices. Now, Kubernetes itself has certain policies like pod security policies or uh, network policies, things like that. But very often these are, you know, pod security policies in particular um, is right now in alpha state and there's no point, uh, there's no goal uh, roadmap or there's no plan to take that beyond because of some of the limitations and challenges with adopting PSPs, uh, which, you know, the way they were designed was they tie back into role bindings and to configure PSPs really there's no way of rolling these out the way it's defined right now uh, without impacting existing workloads, right? So uh, the, the idea is, and moving forward, there will be policy management tools and I'll profile Kiverno as a policy management tool. There's of course, open policy agent, which is also an alternative. And I'll discuss, you know, a briefly a comparison between the two, but there needs to be other ways of securing configurations auditing, reporting, as well as, you know, checking uh, for configurations and best practices. Now, the other thing to keep in mind is that these policies are not just something you want to apply um, at admission control or j even just within your cluster, right? They need to be things which you can check offline in your CI CD pipeline. So um, just like you would with image scanning, the best practice would be to not even allow um, as builds occur, as you know, YAMLs are generated or checked in into Git, you wanna make sure that you're checking for the right security and best practice configurations. And you want to then, of course, have another layer of enforcement at admission control. And even with admission controls, because there are ways to get around admission controls, as you might have seen in other, uh, uh, you know, KubeCon sessions, or, you know, if an admission controller happens to be down for a certain amount of time, uh, to be able to also, you know, have a layer of background scanning, right? So all three of these are required, and this is what we'll talk about as we're uh, looking at some of these configuration security. So just to quickly introduce Kiverno, the, the policy management tool that I'll, I'll talk, and we'll look at this live, we'll show, look at some demos in action. So the idea here is to use Kubernetes itself and to use the extensibility of Kubernetes to be able to define and manage policies, right? So um, the, uh, what this does is to be able to, uh, with Kiverno, you can validate configurations using overlay styles. So if you're uh, familiar with customize, uh, overlays are a way of defining uh, uh, some you know, YAML fragment, which you can use to then you know, check whether uh, the expected you know, YAML exists in the configuration that you're inspecting. You can also mutate, you know, with Kiverno, so you can, uh, Kiverno can plug in as an admission controller. Um, so you can mutate uh, and we support, uh, Kiverno supports both JSON patches as well as um, uh, strategic merge patch, which again is what Kubernetes uses, Kubectl uses uh, as you are, you know, dealing with configurations. Another feature here is to be able to generate configurations and this is especially useful uh, for namespace based, you know, multi-tenancy. So to generate and synchronize configurations across namespaces. And Kiverno, you know, uh, I mentioned it acts as an admission controller, but it also does background scanning 
and it also has you know some offline scanning uh, to be able to use uh, this uh, within your CI CD pipeline, right? So there was a question on chat, which was also on scanning. So uh, if you're using Kiverno, it covers all three. If you're using OPA, there's conf test, which you can use uh, in dev, uh, you know, outside of the cluster. And uh, there is, I'm not sure if Gatekeeper or OPA uh, do scanning within the cluster, but they are able to do this, you know, within the CI CD pipeline and then as admission controls. All right, so just a quick, you know, kind of, you know, overview of what a policy in Kiverno looks like. And again, we'll see some of this live. Um, so policy is composed of one or more rules and each rule can match certain resources. And there's a lot of flexibility. The whole point of, you know, designing Kiverno is to make it as Kubernetes native as possible. So there's a lot of flexibility in how you would match resources, exclude resources, based on namespaces, label selectors, kinds, uh, even user roles, groups, things like that. And then once you match the right set of resources you wanna apply that policy to, you are able to mutate, validate, generate configurations uh, through Kiverno itself, right? So a sample policy looks something like this, and we'll actually, again, look at this live, look at the policy in action. But just to, if you see the structure, it's very simple to understand, right? So it's got a message that will be shown. Uh, it, it's saying that it's checking. Uh, it's using two patterns, right? So that's why we have the any pattern declaration. So if any of these patterns fails, then the policy itself will fail. Um, and here we're checking the security context uh, at the pod level. So this policy is applying to a pod and we're checking a security context at the container level. So it's doing checks at both and if at least if one of these is defined, then the rule passes and, and this configuration uh, is, you know, at least passes this policy. In the Kiverno project itself, we have about, you know, 20 or 30 best practice policies. Uh, it covers all of the PSP, you know, uh, checks that you would want to do. And by the way, pod security policies are evolving. There's a proposal uh, to have, you know, standard uh, profile levels for pod security and Kiverno will support that and be able to uh, indicate what profile level your workloads, your pods are compliant with. So just a quick comparison of, you know, how Kiverno works and uh, with OPA, which open policy agent, right? So uh, on the left, I have, you know, the same policy uh, as on the right. On the right, we have the Kiverno example. On the left, we have the OPA example. So the big difference here is if you're using uh, open policy agent, your policies are gonna be written in Rego. And this is something that either you would, you know, get a policy bundle or you would need to manage and you know understand Rego uh, to be able to you know configure and administer these, and then you know you would need something like Gatekeeper with its constraints language and things on top to manage that Rego itself. So the complexity and the common you know kind of feedback we've heard the reason why we developed Kiverno as an alternative um, is that you know Rego of course has some learning curve. Uh, it is a programming language you know and it. Uh, requires uh, understanding it and being familiar with it. And um, also like using, you know, other tools on top like Gatekeeper and uh, ConfTest, et cetera, uh, they start adding some complexity as well, right? So in, in contrast, Kiverno is pretty straightforward. Uh, if you understand Kubernetes resources and if you're familiar with how, you know, different deployments, pods, work, stateful sets, et cetera, work, Kiverno is very, very much, you know, uh, in tune with that and uses uh, the other advantages. You can use all the same tools like kubectl. Uh, you can use, you know, GitOps style workflows, customize uh, policies themselves become Kubernetes resources, right? So it's very easy to write a customization and change your policy, uh, which you can't really do uh, if you're looking at Rego, right? So uh, that's, the, you know, kind of the, the main trade-off here. Uh, but it's, you know, something that you should explore and kind of see which one works best. And what we're doing is we're, of course, as we, as these tools mature and as these um, get built out within the policy working group, we're looking at ways to standardize certain aspects of policy management for Kubernetes. And that's a very, you know, interesting area of development as well. 
So some information on Kiverno, but I want to kind of go to a demo here and we'll come back to this. And, you know, also um, I'll show you what the repo and things look like. So where you can find uh, info, but let's, you know, switch to a quick demo itself, right? So the first thing, uh, what I'm going to do is I'll bring up, I'll show you, you know, and we'll just follow the instructions as we uh, would as a new user. So let me hide my meeting controls because that always gets in the way. So if you go to kiverno.io or to the GitHub, you'll see, you know, um, our documentation is all in Git. Um, and all I'm going to do on my cluster is I'm going to just use the simple way of installing. It's a one line, you know, configuration. And let's take a look. Let's make sure that I have a cluster available. So here I'm just using on my Windows laptop, I'm using uh, Docker for Windows, and I have a Kubernetes cluster, which doesn't have anything in it right now, right? So I'm going to paste that one line, you know, kind of configuration, and this is going to, you know, install Kiverno. So if we go back and do get namespace, we should see there's a Kiverno namespace. If I do, um, let's see what's running in there. We should see, you know, the Kiverno pod running which is good and it looks like it's ready and everything's initialized, right? The way this works is when the pod comes up, it has an init container, which also registers itself as a mutating and validating webhook. So at this point, every API request that you know is sent, Kiverno has visibility into, but we haven't configured any policies yet, right? So like I mentioned on, our, on, our, on the Kiverno side, there's several best practice policies. If you go scroll down to our documentation and look at sample policies, uh, pretty much everything you would find in pod security policies uh, plus other policies are all available here. Uh, and we're constantly adding more. We also have, you know, feel free to submit a PR or even a, a feature request if you feel that there is a policy missing and there's more being added, uh, uh, you know, kind of pretty much uh, on a daily or weekly basis. What I'm going to do for this demo is I'm going to go back and I have here one of these policies. So in my, in, in my, you know, kind of scratch folder, I have a lot of different policies. I'm going to use the same policies I showed in the slides, right? So it's a little bit familiar. So all this is doing is it's checking to make sure uh, that, you know, a root user, a pod is not, cannot be run as a root user. And this policy is written to uh, authenticate or to match pods, right? So let's do, let's go ahead and apply that policy. Um, so what I'm going to do uh, now is I'll say create minus F and this is in my temp folder. So I'll pick up, you know, the policies from that. So this is the policy I want to apply. And now if I do, you know, in my cluster, I do get CPOL cluster policy for short. I see that I have one policy, right? So let's try and run a workload um, at this point and see what happens, right? So I'm just gonna, I, I have another, you know, an Nginx deployment I usually use for testing and uh, policies and different things. So I'm just gonna say create minus F and C temp Nginx YAML, right? So what you see is I have one policy and what that policy it did is it scanned this resource as it was being applied and it said it was blocked and it because you know running as root user is not allowed. So let's take a look at the YAML and see what we have over here and why it got blocked. And a few things I want to kind of uh, point out which are somewhat interesting. So this is a YAML, very, very simple, straightforward, right? So I have some resource quotas. But the thing uh, here is I have a deployment and, you know, that deployment is, it doesn't have, you know, the required configuration from the policy, right? So run as non-root is, you know, not set to true and which is why this particular policy failed itself. The other thing I want to mention is this, uh, what I ran was a deployment, right? I did not run a pod. But Kiverno was smart enough to, to detect that, you know, a workload controller was running when there was, uh, or was trying to run, and there was a policy defined at a pod level. So what Kiverno does is it automatically generates policies for workload controllers, 
you can manage, you can control which um, you know workload controllers it targets. But um, by default, it will do this for most of the common types like deployment, stateful sets, job, cron jobs, etc. Um, and uh, because of that, it, I got this message back when I tried to create the deployment. If Giverno did not have this feature, what would have happened is my deployment would have been accepted, but then it, I would see a failure when I tried to, you know, when the pod was created, which is just a little bit kludgy and hard to debug, hard to kind of figure out, right? So it's several, and that's just one little example of a feature uh, in Kiverno. There's several such features uh, which make it super easy to, you know, manage these policies. Because it's a Kubernetes native tool, uh, it can take advantage of the knowledge uh, of Kubernetes, you know, workloads and how they are structured to do some of these kind of, you know, tasks, right? So, you know, feel free to browse uh, the repos, um, you know, laid out in terms of there's a, a number of different things documented here. You can try the, some of the simple examples, but that's, you know, where that's the first thing that we believe is required when you are, you know, trying to configure secure self-service. So with something like Kiverno in your clusters, now you can, you know, you have not only, so by the way, here I, I was running Kiverno in enforce mode. I could run this in audit mode and just have it report back policy violations, which I could then, you know, later choose to, uh, you know, manage or, you know, based on those policy violations, I can go inform the workload owner that something needs to be fixed uh, in their particular policies, right? So lots of flexibility in how things are done. Uh, and very, very native to Kubernetes and easy to use um, here, right? So again, that's one of the things you need, but not the only thing you're gonna need to get to secure self-service Kubernetes. Uh, but with something like Kiverno, you can now you know, sort of have the peace of mind that configurations are following best practices as workloads are running. Uh, in production, you, you wanna enforce and block the things which are non-secure. Uh, and which you know don't have things like resource quotas or probes, uh, all of that you can do. Uh, and in dev test, you might want to run in audit mode and, and just inform uh, users of this. Oh, one thing I should show, and this goes back to the scanning. Uh, so before we kind of move to the next topic, it is the same. In, and here I did, I tried to apply this through kubectl, right? Uh, when I created this, but I can also do something like I can say. Um, uh, use the uh, Kiverno kubectl plugin. So I'll just run this. Um, so this is a CLI, which you can find from using crew and you can install as a kubectl plugin. And what I wanna do is I'm gonna apply a policy now in my CI CD pipeline. Uh, so I'll apply that same policy to that same uh, YAML and we'll see what happens, right? So in this case, I wanna do um, let's go find that policy. So we'll say disallow root users and I would say minus R for resources. And you can even apply an entire folder of policies if you have these, or you can apply, you know, one at a time, uh, depending on whatever is easier. And the workload here was just this Nginx workload that we wanted to do, right? So it, Kiverno will also, it, this runs in an offline mode and what happens is it applied. Um, so there's two resources, the deployment and the service. And it said, you know, one pass because the service passed because there was no policy for that, but one failed and it's telling you exactly what failed, right? So this is how you would run Kiverno in an offline mode uh, and be able to apply and kind of uh, manage policies as part of your CI CD pipeline itself. Okay, so let's let's go back, um, you know, to the next section, and we'll take a look at you know virtual clusters um, and cluster virtualization as the next topic that you might want to consider uh, as you're looking at self-service. Yeah, so a couple of other questions. Um, let me answer on that this section before we move in. Um, so. Uh, the one question was, how do you spell the, the uh, what is the language that OPA uses? It's Rego, R-E-G-O, Rego or Rego. Um, and the Kiverno GitHub link, if you uh, look at you know, in the Nirmata GitHub repo, uh, it's just Kiverno. So you can go, let me just display that. It's github.com 
Kivarno uh, can also add that in, um, in in the chat or we'll make the links available. Or if you just go to kivarno.io, you'll also be able to get to the GitHub from there. All right, so let's go back and talk about virtual clusters next. So Kubernetes, as many of you probably already know, uh, the, the origins of Kubernetes you know, were from uh, basically trying to schedule and bin pack containerized workloads on infrastructure, right? So the idea is you have a pool of resources, a pool of infrastructure, um, and Kubernetes is going to you know, figure out the best placement, the best you know, bin packing algorithm for making optimal use of those resources. Um, so, so that's where, you know, I, I, I think, and that it's sort of unfair to think of Kubernetes only in that sense, but that's one of the core functions. The scheduler portion uh, is one of the core functions of what it does, right? Uh, but of course, as we, as we were just discussing policies and workloads, we know Kubernetes also has, you know, a fair amount of complexity and rightly so, because it solves some very complex problems. Uh, so there is there is a learning curve and there's learning to do uh, things to master within Kubernetes itself, and what this has done is because of that security, you know, the the challenges in deploying security, um, you know, um, more and more like what we've seen is teams have said, okay, I'll just deploy my own cluster, uh, you know, we don't sort of and you kind of bypass that central management, right? So. This is where, you know, if you kind of look back again in the progression of most technologies, virtualization and almost every, like when you think about networking or storage or um, even compute, uh, things started in the physical world and eventually we had virtual, uh, you know, kind of abstractions for those resources, right? So similarly, we believe that Kubernetes is going through the same curve and Eventually, you know, I believe it's going to be more popular to use virtual clusters versus uh, actual physical clusters uh, because virtualization just, you know, allows a lot of flexibility. And typically when you think about virtualization here, what we're discussing is more defining a software defined form of a resource itself. So rather than, you know, having to manage an entire cluster, if as a developer, I want my own sandbox, I can get my own virtual cluster. Uh, or if I, you know, even as a team or as an application, uh, I'm using a virtual cluster. To me, it's a Kubernetes endpoint, as long as it's compliant with the Kubernetes APIs um, and there's no unnecessary abstractions, um, you know, that makes it super easy to manage Kubernetes, right? So here, what we're, you know, specifically gonna discuss is namespaces based virtualization and how to achieve that, right? So this is more suitable and you might all have heard that, you know, like hard multi-tenancy with Kubernetes is hard, right? It's, dif it's difficult to achieve. Uh, some might claim it could be even uh, to completely secure Kubernetes and have a virtual cluster. You, you have to start replicating things and segmenting things. Uh, and there are ways to do that, but that's not something you would typically do within an enterprise, right? So the type of sharing and the type of reuse we're looking at over here is for teams within an enterprise, within an organization um, that are looking to share a cluster. And, and that model we see as being very popular uh, in terms of a request and, and to be able to mature that and use that easily is what the multi-tenancy working group is focused on. There's various projects. There's um, a project called HNC, which is hierarchical network uh, controller or namespace controller. Uh, there's also, you know, uh, the, uh, the Kubernetes um, multi-tenancy benchmarks, which I'll talk about. That's one of the tracks that uh, I work with and that I'm leading within the working group. And then there's solutions being developed for control plane type virtualization. There's a proposal from Alibaba on, you know, actually having separate API servers. Um, and different, you know, uh, so to allow control plane based virtualization. So there's also other solutions for data plane virtualizations, but th again, those are more advanced topics and you require, it's not just standard Kubernetes at that point, you're extending Kubernetes uh, in some way to be able to leverage those. So let's, let's focus on namespaces, right? So what do you need if I have, you know, 
uh, I want to use namespaces across teams. So obviously you can deploy a workload in a namespace. And if you look at the Kubernetes doc, it, it in fact says Kubernetes supports multiple virtual clusters backed by the same physical cluster. And these virtual clusters are called namespaces. So problem solved, right? Well, <laughs> not that easy. Uh, namespaces are just one part of what you need uh, to fully segment and isolate workloads. Uh, what you're also going to need, of course, is some way to automate and manage access controls. So role bindings uh, as you know, namespaces are created, requested, things like that. You're going to need network policies. So you don't want workloads to be necessarily talking to each other or even having access to each other. So you need network policies for that. Then you're going to need limits and quotas, right? So uh, you need to make sure that one sort of noisy or one you know, namespace that mis misbehaves doesn't take down everything else. So you need uh, proper limits and quotas configured. And you're gonna need you know, the pod security aspects of this runtime security to make sure that if somebody, uh, pods are not accessing host resources, pods cannot you know, escape out uh, from, from their, their, you know, their uh, PID or their namespace itself. So all of those things need to be checked and done, right? So there's quite a lot of configurations and things which have to be managed. But the good news is Kubernetes does have constructs for each one of these. And there are ways to automate this and there are ways to measure this. And I'm going to talk about, you know, the, this uh, multi-tenancy benchmarks is what we, you know, uh, are developing within the working group as a way to measure this. So the goal there is independently of how namespaces are configured or which tool you use or how you use to create these namespaces, how do you measure that a namespace is properly configured uh, and you know, doesn't have any uh, multi-tenancy type violations, right? So this is you know, the, the link that I'm sharing is within the Kubernetes SIGs. Uh, there's a repo and actually let me, I'm gonna do a, another demo where we're next going to look at this, right? And here, I'm going to hide the meeting controls again. So if I go to the multi-tenancy repo under Kubernetes 6, um, uh, within that folder, within the benchmarks folder, so within multi-tenancy, you can get to benchmarks. Um, and within benchmarks, you can get to, you know, this tool called kubectl MTB. So it's another kubectl plugin. And the goal of this plugin is to measure multi-tenancy, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to, let's run this in a different namespace. And I'm going to show you how this tool works. So here, uh, let me check my namespaces again. I'm going to create, you know, a namespace called, um, let's call it multi-tenant test, right? Empty test. Uh, oops, I need to tell it what to create. Okay, so now the next thing I'm gonna need in this multi-tenant test namespace is I need some roles, some user roles to use to create um, or to build this, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and, and by the way, the instructions for what I'm doing right now are all on this website. So here, notice it says create a namespace user role, create a namespace. So I'm just kind of following along and doing exactly this, right? So I'm gonna use, um, Let's do minus N in multi-tenant test. And I'm going to say create minus F uh, here. Under my inner root, I think I have or this role, so role binding. So let's go ahead and create that. Um, so now if I look in my namespace and if I say get role binding, or let's actually just describe it so you see what it looks like. What I'll have is one role binding for this user, Ali, who is a namespace admin in here, right? So the first thing now, and I, by the way, already just to save some time, I have built this tool. But if I, you know, want to just run this, if I do kubectl mtb, um, you know, and if I do get, it's going to show me all the available benchmarks and check that this tool can do, right? So there's about 16 or so benchmarks that will do. And what I can do is now if I say, um, if I just look at the help, the other thing we can do is we can say run. I'm going to say namespace multi-tenant test. And just, you know, uh, to start with, I'm going to use a role which is not defined and it should produce some errors. 
right? So if I say minus as, or I think it should be minus minus as, and we'll say, let's try Jim. And there's no role for Jim, right? So it should show me some errors that it can't run these checks uh, and none of these can be applied um, for this particular namespace, right? So that's what you're seeing. It's going, going through that bunch of errors. A few things passed because I did configure a, a role, right? So, and I did configure a namespace. So as that user, I'm not able to, well, the user doesn't exist. So I'm not able to go ahead and, you know, do anything meaningful with that. But now let's run this as this user, Ali, uh, who we configured before and see what happens, right? So at this point, instead of errors, what I'm expecting is, you know, my check should actually fail because uh, the user exists, but I'm not able to, you know, pass these tests based on the user. So if you just create a user by default using, uh, or a namespace by default, this is what you're gonna get. Um, now, how do we fix this, right? So to, to fix this, you can again use a policy management tool uh, like Giverno or like, you know, OPA Gatekeeper. And there's examples for both here. Like if you want to try Gatekeeper, you want to try Giverno, uh, you can do that. But I'm going to apply all of the Giverno policies uh, that are required to start passing these particular checks, right? So just, you know, following the instructions again on the uh, multi-tenancy benchmarks website, I applied all of the policies required. And there's about, if I do, you know, group cuddle, get CPOL again, I'll see there's a whole bunch of policies now configured, right? Um, and let's run that test again to see what happens this time around. So we're running again as user alley in the same namespace to see is this namespace properly configured for multi-tenancy. And what I'm expecting to see is for everything where we have a standard policy, uh, there will be, so you see a lot more passes. We still see a few failures because in this namespace, we just created it. I don't have any quotas. So let me go back and um, actually uh, we'll add some quotas, right? So here I have like namespace quota. If I add that and let's rerun this test one more time, we should see more passes again, right? So I think you get the idea of how using some of these tools now gets you to a point where you're able to, um, you know, apply these policies and be able to configure namespaces in a well, quite a secure manner uh, where the only uh, failure we have right now is there is no policy, there's out uh, an issue logged on this. So right now there's no policy for node ports. So once we have that policy defined in here, uh, this check will also pass. And the reason why this check is failing uh, is because you know we do with um, kubectl with MTB, you need to define a label uh, for how to identify multi-tenant resources. So that's expected to you know show an error in this case, right? So. Again, a simple way, a very quick way of, you know, creating namespaces and managing them. Uh, and that's, you know, how you can get to namespace-based virtualization uh, using, you know, using um, uh, Kiverno or other policy engines, as well as you can use um, the benchmarking tool to now audit for this. The other thing I want to show is, and now I'm going to show actually uh, how this works in Nirmata. So just as an example for what can be built using this, um, here, I, you know, I have a Nirmata account. So for those of you who are not familiar with Nirmata, Nirmata is a multi-cluster management tool. Uh, this is my cloud-based account. It's a SaaS-based product, uh, as well as can run on-prem as a private edition. I have, you know, a few different clusters, like three clusters in this account. Um, and what I'm gonna do is I'm actually, I've configured a user as a DevOps user uh, which is a restricted role, right? And that user, so although I have three clusters in this account, if I do nctl, which is the Nilmata command line, if I say, say clusters get, I only have access to one cluster. But what I can also do is I can, you know, create environments which are virtual clusters in Nilmata. So I can do environments, create, and that will tell me how I can create an environment. So in this case, I could say something like, Minus minus. Uh, so let's say you know we'll call it demo env uh, one, and then I'm going to say minus minus cluster, and I'm going to use prod demo. Um, whoops, 
and I need to give in Nirmata, we have to give it an environment type and these types are configurable by the admin. And in my account, I just happen to know I have a type called medium. So I'm going to create an environment of that type, right? So really all it took is now in, in a few seconds as a developer, I can request a virtual cluster. I got a virtual cluster and this is a properly configured namespace with all of the policies, everything required for security, for resource quotas, for network policies, for the roles, and only I have access to this namespace, right? So now I can invite others from my team as required uh, to be able to provision this. So everything I did, of course, you can also do from the Nirmata UI, but I just kind of wanted to show what that would look like uh, if I did this you know, from, uh, from you know, the command line itself. All right, so that's the second second thing I wanted to cover, and I know we only have 10 minutes left, so I'll speed up a little bit. And I do want to cover very quickly the last portion, uh, which is add-on services and why that's necessary, right? So what are add-on services? I think uh, all of you know, like when you bring up Kubernetes or if you use the Kubernetes dashboard, there are some standard add-ons like metric server, et cetera. Um, and even the dashboard itself is, would be an add-on if you're using Minikube. Um, but so typically within an enterprise, there's cluster level add-ons, and these are shared services that are used by every team, by every tenant, and they must be installed. They have to be present for security, for governance, for policy management, like with Kiverno. And, and then there are other add-ons which you might need for, you know, um, which are maybe optional, but, you know, useful for uh, on an environment basis or on a team basis, right? So good examples of this are like using Prometheus for monitoring your app, using perhaps Loki for your log management, uh, in, you know, ingress controllers for your namespace, so on, right? So the challenge with add-ons is who manages these? How do you make sure that the right version is running, uh, that the workloads that are being deployed, again, are secure, they're maintained properly, and how do you, you know, update these across all of the clusters, right? So what I'll show you as kind of the last demo that I want to cover here uh, is, again, I'll, I'll kind of show first how this works in Nirmata, and then we'll talk about some of the, um, you know, procedures behind it. So this time, what I want to do is I want to say NCTL cluster types. Get. So instead of environment types, I'm looking at the available cluster types. And as a developer right now, what I have available to me is this one cluster type, uh, which it says it's a, on GKE, it's a Google Cloud and uh, Kubernetes engine cluster. Um, and what I want to do is I want to request a new cluster, right? So I'm going to say cluster create. And if I look at that command, it requires a few uh, flags. So I'm going to say, let's say I'll call this GKE um, demo one. And then I'm going to call, you know, give the required flags it has. So here I have to say cluster type. And we'll say GKE demo because that's the only cluster type available to me as this particular user, right? So much like before we saw with virtual clusters, what happens is now Nirmata has received that request. If I go into back into the Nirmata account, I'm seeing that uh, GKE demo cluster one is, uh, you know, has started provisioning. And in fact, if I go to my Google console, it should have picked up the request and I'll see that here too. But what's interesting here is not just that, okay, we're able to create a cluster, that's fine. But what happens, you know, how is this cluster configuration managed, right? How is it that I'm only able to specify, uh, I really didn't specify anything other than the cluster type. Um, and the way this is done is through separation of controls, right? So if I go look in Nirmata and I look at the cluster type that we use, GKE demo, the administrator has provisioned all of this and this is possible to do through the UI, or you can do it through Terraform or you can do it through the command line. Uh, but this is where all of the details of what's required in that cluster, including the add-on services that are required are configured. Now, once this is configured, what this enables is when somebody wants a cluster, they don't have to repeat all of this information. They're just saying, hey, give me a cluster of this type and here's how many nodes I want in that cluster, right? So again, the idea is to have a central team manage this. And if I quickly look at uh, you know, how, let's say one of these add-ons is managed, if I go into my catalog, 
Um, and let's look at this, you know, uh, application. So I want to see how the vault injector is managed. So this actually is pointing to a Git upstream, which controls, which has the YAMLs for this. So I can use Git ops, I can change the YAMLs, uh, and this is uh, the platform team would be able to manage this application. And that would automatically then get rolled out to one or more, you know, um, uh, one or more uh, uh, you know, clusters which are listening to this. And I can, as a platform team, I can create a release whenever I want. So if I have some new changes, I can also publish this release in any of these channels. And that's where, so I think this already exists. So let's call it uh, two. And if we publish this, this will create, it'll pick up the YAMLs, the latest YAMLs, create a new release and start a rollout across all of the downstream clusters that require that particular application, right? Now, all of this, of course, you can do also through GitOps, you can do through Customize and your own CI CD tools. Uh, but the idea here is to centralize the add on management and make it super easy for one team to be able to, you know, a central team to manage the add ons, the required add ons like Vault, et cetera, right? So if you go back and GKE typically takes up, you know, about five minutes or so to bring up the cluster, this cluster should be coming up, you know, fairly soon. Uh, and the nice thing is when that cluster comes up, not only is it provisioned with all of the required add-ons, but if I go, you know, in a separate window, I have, you know, vault open. Uh, if I actually go and look at my, uh, you know, policies here, I will see that, you know, once that cluster is created, uh, the vault uh, authentication path is automatically created. The cluster uh, does its handshake with vault, which I have configured. And then at that point, it's able to, you know, securely get secrets from Vault, right? So again, this is not something then each developer has to manage or each team, but it can be centrally managed, uh, you know, through through a platform team. All right, so just a quick summary, you know, of what we covered and really enabling self-service security. I guess my hypothesis and what I, you know, started with was it requires at least three things. So workload policies, virtual clusters, and add-on services management. And the good thing is Kubernetes has some pretty well-defined and great constructs for all of these, uh, as well as you know, in the community uh, through tools like Nirmata. Uh, there's a lot of things that you can, be, uh, you can sort of leverage and make this easy uh, across different you know, cloud providers, across different infrastructure vendors. And this is where I love this you know, kind of quote from Grady Booch. Uh, for those of you familiar with, you know, programming concepts, Grady Booch is one of the, I guess the, you can call him a father of object oriented and other theories uh, where, you know, he says you cannot reduce complexity, right? Uh, complexity is natural, but the best you can do is manage it. So similarly with Kubernetes, I think we need to shift our thinking from trying to, you know, reduce that to be able to come up with the right ways of managing it. So definitely, you know, there's a lot of topics we covered. So feel free to, again, reach out to me on the Kubernetes Slack or on Twitter or LinkedIn. Um, you know, uh, you can contact me on pretty much everywhere as Jim Bigwadia. And, uh, you know, if you are interested in Kiverno or in any of the other projects I mentioned, uh, feel free to check it out uh, from the Git repo. Also, if you want to try Nirmata, there's a 15-day free trial at try.nirmata.io. So feel free to sign up. There's no credit card or anything required. You can just sign up and uh, register your clusters and start using it. All right. So I think uh, that's everything I wanted to cover. And I know we're you know um, up on time. So let me check and see if there's any questions. There's one other question which we haven't answered. So the question is, uh, what exactly it, it was the environment that we created? So good question, and I kind of rushed through that. Uh, environment is really a virtual cluster using namespaces. So it, it contains a namespace, it contains network policies, resource quotas, role bindings, uh, pretty much everything that we audited for using uh, the MTB, the multi-tenancy benchmarks tool. So all of that is pre-configured in an environment. And in addition to that, Nirmata gives administrators a way to manage environment types. So this makes it easy to have either different t-shirt sizes or different quota levels, uh, and you can manage which, you know, where these environments are registered. Okay, well, thank you very much.
um, for your time, Jim. That was a wonderful presentation. Uh, that's about all the time we have for today. Um, as I said before, today's recording and slides will be posted later today to the CNCF webinar page at cncf.io slash webinars. Thank you all for attending. Thank you again, Jim, for the wonderful presentation. Everybody stay safe, take care, and we'll see you all next time. All right. Thanks, Jerry. Bye, everyone.